talk about uh, C++ extensions, um, and C extensions a little bit too, uh, Ruby, uh, Charles Cornell. I've been writing Ruby apps for about five years. Um, got uh, slightly less time in, uh, in web apps, but most of my experience is, is writing Ruby applications to, to automate tasks um, in uh, semiconductors, uh, which is my background. So, uh, you know, what got me interested in, in uh, both in C++ on Ruby uh, had um, had some performance problems getting data into and out of a SQLite database, and so I had a C++ wrapper around that uh, that I did to kind of get past uh, the holdup. Uh, and I wanted to use it everywhere. Uh, I had a standalone C++ app that, that called that library, uh, and then I had a, a Ruby app that I wanted to, to call it from, and I also had an, an Octave application as well. And if you don't know, Octave is an open source MATLAB clone that they use a lot in the signal processing and analog uh, mode. And uh, this is just some stuff that I picked up along the way. <coughs> so, you know, kind of the first question is, well, when would you want to use uh, a C++ or C extension? And sort of the obvious answer is performance. Um, there's a couple of other times, like if you, if there's already a C library out there that does what you need, um, you know, why reinvent the wheel? Um, and the other option is, which was the case I had, I had a C++ library, but I wanted to call it from multiple scripting languages. Um, and if I had implemented that in Ruby instead, that would have been more difficult. So um, it's important to know which one of these are, are requirements for you so that you select the correct tool uh, to build your extension. Um, so if you're going for performance, if that's the driver for you, you know, what, what can you expect? Um, well, like in any code, if you make bad choices about how you architect it, maybe not very much. Uh, probably a lot less than you were hoping for. Um, that's why, you know, when you start, you want to make sure you understand exactly what is slow, um, because that affects what, what you push into the C extension and how you define your interface. And the, the definition of the interface can have a uh, significant impact on the performance of that extension. Uh, and just an example, like if, you know, say you have a loop that you go through a bunch of times and, and it's taken a while, you know, you want to make sure you port enough of the loop. What, what you port to your extension needs to take enough time so that the overhead of going from Ruby to C and back to Ruby isn't a significant portion of, of the time spent in C. Um, and I've, I've seen uh, performance improvements of anywhere from, you know, 3 to 4x to, to over 100x. Um, so, uh, simple advice for getting started, you know, whiskey does not hurt at all. It, it's, you know, a really good way to start your, your endeavor there. Um, it, a couple of things to keep in mind is if you build a traditional um, C or C++ extension, it is going to depend on the Ruby interpreter you use. Um, so it's not going to work with JRuby. Uh, it won't work with Rubinius. Um, and even there are differences in the version of Ruby as well. So those are typically fairly minor, but they do require a uh, recompile. Uh, you're going to have some weaker errors, you know, just kind of get your hands dirty, get over it. Um, you know, they're, they're not that bad. Um, and then understand your performance needs and what interpreter, interpreter you're going to use so that you select the, the best tool for the job. And so with that, let's go through some of the tools that, that I came across when I was looking to do this. So FFI is... Um, it's been around for a really long time, but it's actually fairly new to Ruby. Um, it stands for Foreign Function Interface, and, and it's just a way in pure Ruby you can call a C function, an arbitrary C function from any uh, shared library. Um, 
all at runtime. There, there's no compile, you don't have to set up anything. You just, in Ruby, you define the, the interface and then uh, you can call you know, the C functions that you need. And it's becoming fairly sophisticated and for C only, it's a pretty good choice. It, it, and it, and it uh, has some advantages. So the other one is Rice. It's uh, basically a C++ DSL uh, for interfacing with the Ruby C thing. So you know, if you're writing C++, then you can define your interface in C++, and um, that's what Rice lets you do. Uh, RB++ is a tool that it sits on top of Rice, and it um, basically writes the Rice code part. So we're going to talk about that. And then uh, Swig, it's kind of probably the one you think of uh, first, maybe it's been around the longest. Um, and it, uh, its advantage is it supports multiple languages, which is why we're going to talk about it more later. Um, so, after I find, you know, I try to be clever, find some pictures and stuff, you know. But anyway, it's really hard to find a picture for FFI, so I had to stoop to the um, French Forces of the Interior which was a uh, resistance group in World War II. But they, uh, they came to my rescue. So. Uh, anyway, like I said, FFI, it's a clean solution for C libraries. Uh, it's not good for C++. It doesn't reflect classes. And the C++ name mangling uh, makes, makes the FFI uh, just mess it up. Um, so it's, it, it's not really applicable for that. Um, it's Ruby only, but independent of the interpreter, like I said, and uh, it does have some additional overhead versus uh, traditional C extension, uh, but if you just want access to an existing C library, then it's probably the least, uh, least work to do. So, uh, I mean, it's a really exciting solution that just didn't do exactly what, what I needed. Um, and uh, let's see how we're doing. I would just skip that. Uh, so Rice is the other tool. Um, a Rice field in Bali. Anybody cares? Um, so I, like I said, Rice is a C++ DSL uh, to interface with Ruby C. Um, it's not generic and interface uh, generator. Uh, so it is Ruby only. Um, but you know, if you like C++, then you know, it's probably a pretty good choice because then you can do everything for your extension in C++. You don't have this separate suite language or something like that. Uh, and RB++, um, it makes Rice more like Swig in that it, it uses something called GCC XML, which is an XML description of your C++ library, and then it writes the Rice code for you. Uh, and then compiles your extension to, to build that interface. And uh, I have not used this one. Um, I just I looked into it as one of the possible choices, um, but it seemed kind of interesting under certain use cases. Uh, so Swig uh, turns out Swig is a club in San Francisco, um, so kind of cool. Uh, so Swig, the way Swig works is. It, SWIG stands for Simplified Wrapper and Interface Generator. And so it, it, um, it parses your C++ header files and it understands nearly all of the C++ syntax. And then it writes the, the wrapper code for you to build uh, the Ruby classes and the methods and all that. And it, uh, it does reflect the C++ hierarchy and uh, supports multiple languages uh, listed here. And I highlighted a couple just to point out a few things. Um, Python is highlighted because that's where Swig came from. Um, the guy that started Swig was a Python developer. Uh, and I don't know when he started that, like in 92 or something, it was a while. Uh, and then Ruby, obviously, and, and the support for Ruby is actually pretty good. It's not, it's not bad. And then uh, Octave as well, and that was what interested me was I wanted to, to support Ruby and Octave with my extension. Uh, so let's uh, look at just a quick little example um, to gauge kind of where you can gain performance and, and how much. So 
This is a little test I ran. Um, uh, it's 100,000 inserts into a SQLite database. And the top two lines just make a 100,000 element array with the rows you're going to insert. Uh, and then the middle section here, uh, you know, we, we open a transaction, prepare an SQL statement, and then we loop over our data array um, and uh, execute the SQL and inject uh, the 100,000 statements. And then here in the C++ extension, uh, I just made a function where you give it the, uh, the SQL code and you pass in the full array. So basically, I moved that looping into C++. And, and that's, that's all I did. And by doing that, <coughs> the SQLite way took 9.8 seconds, and in C++ it took 2.6. So it was a 3.7x speed up. And all I did was move a loop into C++. Now, why did that happen, right? It, it's because of the overhead of going from Ruby through the Ruby methods, through the wrapper, down into C++, and then back up with all the type conversions and everything. If you, if you pass the whole array in, then that doesn't happen, right? So it, uh, small stuff can make a difference when you're in that, you know, that type interlude. All right, so um, when you're building a SWIG module, kind of what happens? I just wanted to throw this up for a little information. Um, you just run the SWIG command, and you tell it, hey, this is going to be C++, not C, uh, Ruby, and you pass it the interface file, and it's going to make uh, a C++ uh, file that, that has the wrapper description and the interface description in there. Uh, Compile that into a .o, compile that into a shared library, and then they require, you know, simc underscore dbi, and uh, it'll load it up. So what does the SWIG interface file look like? Well, it's actually relatively simple. I mean, if you want to do simple stuff, it's pretty easy to do that in SWIG. That's, that's one of its positives. Uh, so you just you define the module name, and then it has some kind of canned utilities that provide uh, stuff you could write on your own, but, but they've already written it for common stuff like uh, C++ string, uh, type maps to convert C++ strings to Ruby strings, and then the second include is the, uh, the C++ standard template library has a vector container, and so that has the type map so that you can pass that in and out of the C++ functions. Uh, and then you just, this include, you're just including the header for the file that, that you want to make visible. It, it like that has the class hierarchy you want to make visible in C++, so it's, it's just what you wrote. And then this is uh, copied verbatim into the C file, and it's where you put stuff that's you, it required to compile the file. Um, and the reason they have two sections is Sometimes you have stuff required to compile it that you don't want to make visible in the scripting language. So that's, that's what the two sections are for. All right, so like as I said, uh, it does come with pretty full featured STL support. Um, it has built in type maps for all the STL containers. Um, those, those type maps support passing uh, containers in as arguments to functions and returning those as uh, values from functions. Um, and it makes uh, wrapper objects around those to support that. And they have Ruby-ish interfaces, uh, they use the term somewhat loosely. Uh, and uh, so let's just take vector as an example. If I want to pass vector as an input argument to the function in switch, uh, I would add this line to my SWIG interface file. And what that's going to do is I'm telling it, hey, I want to use a vector of in integers as an argument. Uh, and I'm going to name that int vector. So in Ruby, the type name is int vector. Uh, and then here's the function that you would call, and all it does is loop over the vector and print out the elements. Uh, and then on the Ruby side, you could say something like, hey, I want a new int vector push three ints on there, and then pass that to the function, and then it would print out the elements. 
So if we take a look at um, our new in vector in IRB just to see what it looks like, you can create a new one and initialize it with uh, some elements that way, and then it's going to return this you know hieroglyph hieroglyphic looking thing, uh, you know that's a standard vector of in you know the basic C plus plus class, so it makes it kind of easy to see what what Swig did in that case, and you know then you can use it. In many ways, just like uh, uh, a Ruby array, you can loop over it and print out the elements. Uh, you can ask it, or you can uh, push a new element on. If you try and push something that's not an int, it will raise an exception that uh, it's like a swig type error or something. So you so you do know, so it, it enforces that um, because it really is not a, a Ruby array. Uh, you can ask it how big it is. You can ask it how much memory it's allocated. This is directly from the C++ SDL and it, it will be different typically. Uh, and then you know you can call dot join. Ah, but no love uh, because it's not really a Ruby array. So uh, kind of have to stick with the basic functionality. But that's okay. um, so the other thing that you do in SWIG that I want to talk a little bit about is exception handling because you can throw exceptions in C++ and you can throw exceptions in Ruby and you know, wouldn't it be great if when I threw it in my C++ extension, it looked in Ruby just like it came from, from Ruby, right? And I can handle it the same way. Well, this crazy looking code um, is what does that and this is copied verbatim out of the SWIG help manual. And this particular method works for any scripting language. All you're doing is you, you know, you start with this one catch. Hey, catch anything derived from the base exception class in C++, and it just uh, set the message, and it will show up as a uh, Ruby runtime <coughs> exception uh, in the script. So that works. That works great, right? If you put that in, you can be covered, and you can catch all your exceptions, uh, and that's not bad. But you know. Sometimes you might want to throw different exceptions for different things that go wrong. Like you might have a, a SQLite 3, uh, you know, statement error, right, or, or SQL error, um, or database lock, or something like that. Uh, so to make that happen, uh, the solution I came up with was I added another section in here where I catch a base class that I define. Um, and then I define a Ruby class that's the name of whatever class I, I threw. Uh, I, it, it's a child of runtime error. Uh, and then I raise it with the what message from the C++ exception. And so the C++ code to support that is, you know, I define my error base class, I inherit from the C++ built-in exception class, uh, and then I define a foobar error from that. Uh, and the only thing special about it, it, really the only reason I'm doing that is so that I can set the name of the class that it's going to make a group. Because C++ stinks, and there's no way to get the class name within that class in C++. It's, it's remarkable how difficult they make that. Anyway. Um, there are some compiler and platform specific ways of getting that, but they all give a different answer, like and if anything changes. So it, it's not, this is the best I could come up with. Um, all right, so why did I go with SWIG? Uh, really the main reason is it's the only one that would let me build an extension for Ruby and for Octave without repeating myself. And so it was pretty attractive for that. Uh, one of the other advantages is it, it does let you automate building the interface. So in other words, in the SWIG interface file, once that's set up um, for the data types that you're gonna be using within your app, if you go define a bunch of new methods, you don't have to go read list them. You just you just write the C++ like you know you have to, and then 
is rerun swing and recompile, and the new methods get reflected into the Ruby extension uh, automatically. Uh, and that was that was the advantage, and uh, that's it. So, any questions about the swig or hopefully not rice? I don't know. Yeah. Does it have like one of the things that I've noticed is when I've got Ruby code called C plus plus code called Ruby code. If I throw an exception in Ruby, it'll actually skip over those C plus plus frames. I don't know if it uses go to or whatever or oh. something happens. If that, that like the the, the structure is never get called, and I was wondering, does Swig have some sort of mechanism that you can do to like catch and rethrow in each? Like at each language boundary, uh, uh, to try and make sure that you don't have. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, did you did you use that? Um, I'm not using the Like, oh, okay. that's right now. So I'm wondering if that's that something that could help me out with. Is well, I have to manually make sure that every time there's a boundary. Yes, I. I like propagate. Do not know the answer to that because I didn't. I never did that. I didn't go Ruby to C++ and like have that called that Ruby. Um, I know that Swig has a lot of, so the, the, the good thing about Swig is it's very flexible and the bad thing about Swig is it's very flexible. <laughs> so once you kind of go off the beaten path, you kind of have to get down in there and it can be a little quirky of how you do stuff, but um, like this gets put in the wrapper for every method. It's so like it gets injected, so um, you know there there may well be a way that you can inject something that because that's kind of how it works. It's like, hey, when you see this happen, like I need to do this type conversion, use this code, right? Or when in, or in every wrapper, inject this code. So uh, I don't know for sure, but but it does have quite a lot of options like that. So, but, yeah. So you handle the construction, I mean, Swig handles the construction, deconstruction of the objects, or Ruby does that? Uh, Swig writes uh, the C code, Ruby C code, that constructs the, the class hierarchy on the Ruby side. So if you go look at the bottom of the Swig file, it'll have a bunch of, you know, define class and then define all the methods and everything. And then above that, it has all the, the C wrapper code to do the type conversion. So, but yes, it, it will build all of that automatically. Okay, but it, it doesn't do the instanti instantiation. It, it's this Ruby still, and Ruby garbage collector. And it, it has methods that let you um, affect how you want to handle garbage collection. Like, you, you can register objects in Swig with the garbage collector so that then it knows to call the destructor, or you can tell it, uh, you know, I mean, you just don't register because you don't want it to do anything. Uh, but you do have hooks to do that. Okay. And I haven't done a lot of that, uh, but but I, they they are. Okay. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Oh, so does it when it is does it allocate does you can, does it allocate the C plus plus objects on the stack or on the heap or can you control that? Yeah, so you, you mean like when I do, when, when you say int vector dot u, where, where, where does right. that get out? Does it call malloc in the, you know, or does it call new on C++? I guess it's kind of what you yeah. It does, okay, yes. it, no, just, it, does. It, just it does yeah. call the C++ constructor. Okay. Yeah, yes, it does okay. do that. But when we do that, it will be registered with garbage collection. So when it goes out of scope in Ruby, it will call the destructor for okay. that int vector example. <laughs> Because I'm thinking this would be great for a game if you have a just a huge array of vectors that you have to one process in C++. Drop a, you have to allocate a lot of memory, and then I guess in C++, then you would just deconstruct them all or or whatever you need to do. I guess. Yeah, well, that that's why like it has the wrapper around in vector, <coughs> so you don't have to um, you don't have to build the array in Ruby and then. Copy it in C++, right? Because that, that's a born and loose strategy, yeah. right? That you're never going to get any speed up that way. Uh, so yeah, it does, if you do it the kind of the swig way, it won't make a new copy of it in C++. But you'll be stuck using the 
the STL vector, and you won't have the full Ruby stuff, but uh, if you just build it up an array, then, you know, that's not too bad. So it, it, it does, does have some stuff to keep from happening. That's the one, that's the other advantage of it over something like FFI, because FFI will have more overhead because it has more steps in that wrapper process. It doesn't necessarily make copies of stuff, but that's why it does have more overhead in uh, traditional seasons. Okay. And what is this supposed to be in? Yeah, this stuff I was, uh, yeah, I guess about a quarter after. All right, yeah, we got time for another question. Anybody has one? <coughs> All right, cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks.